We begin with a Fox News alert on that major hurricane now barreling toward the East Coast. Florence, now a Category 4 storm and holding, expected to make landfall in the Carolinas late Thursday night or early Friday. The most powerful hurricane to threaten the Carolinas in nearly three decades <laughs> could bring life-threatening winds and a storm surge anywhere from 10 to 15 feet. States of emergency now declared in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. More than one million people are leaving coastal areas, evacuating mandatorily as Florence approaches. Those citizens that need to evacuate, we implore that you evacuate now. Uh, you heed your local and state warnings and um, do your part and our team and, and to, to help us save lives. We can rebuild infrastructure. We can rebuild homes. Uh, we cannot replace lives. Let's bring in meteorologist Adam Klotz with more on this. Adam, it is holding together, and what does that mean? Well, it means it's going to stay a strong storm as we continue to see it do so. It's a Category 4. It's been a Category 4, still spinning with winds at 130 miles an hour, heading off and will likely maybe even strengthen a little bit more today with those winds climbing back up to 140 to 150 miles an hour. Here's the track we're following as it runs its way closer and closer to the coast. By the time we make landfall, we're going to be talking about early Friday morning, likely a Category 4 storm or a very strong Category 3 storm. Either way, the winds are going to be strong. The impacts from the surge are going to be the same. Again, early Friday morning is the time frame we're looking anywhere from portions of central South Carolina, the central South Carolina coast. So from Charleston running all the way up to Norfolk, Virginia, all areas where you're going to be seeing impacts from this as it eventually makes its way on shore. That's why we're looking at storm surge along these entire areas. Uh, spots, as you mentioned, getting up to maybe over 10 feet, 10 to 15 feet, 6 to 12 feet, running all the way up and down the coast. Now, where exactly this makes landfall will impact where these storm surges are the highest, but it is bringing a lot of water with it. On top of that, it's going to be bringing rain. Here's our tropical models, and this is important. We see a pretty defined line of where this is going to be approaching the Carolinas, but once it gets off the coast, there starts to be a little bit more indecision. So I'll continue all of these models, and you notice them doing a lot of different things here, uh, really slowing down and perhaps spinning off the coast. And that's going to be bad news as far as flooding goes. If it stalls, if it spins a little while, that means there's going to be areas that could see additional rainfall. Spots wouldn't be unheard of to be getting up over two feet of total precipitation. More widespread, you're going to be looking at spots getting up to a foot to 18 inches of rain. This could be a real rainmaker on top of all the wind we're going to be seeing with this system. So no surprise here, we're looking at these uh, hurricane warnings stretching from Charleston all the way up to the North Carolina northern coast uh, state line there uh, because the winds are going to be there, the rain's going to be there, and Harris, yeah, the, the storm surge 10 to 15 feet, it's going to be a big storm. You know, Adam, you and I covered a lot of this activity last year, and one of the things that you reminded everybody is when it goes onshore, when it, when it reaches into the inland, we can see sometimes even twisters and other uh, very dangerous activity, not to mention the flooding. Yeah, I mean, once this starts to get uh, close to onshore, I wouldn't be surprised if there were a couple small tornadoes popping up in the front right, front right quadrant. Uh, there's just going to be a lot to deal with early Friday morning. All right. Adam Klotz, mm -hmm. we appreciate it. Thank you very much. We never forget, a nation remembers September 11th, 17 years after the terror attacks on the United States. Americans remembering the nearly 3,000 lives lost. With somber tributes at Lower Manhattan, the Pentagon, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. This is Outnumbered, and I'm Melissa Francis. Here today is Harris Faulkner, Fox News contributor Lisa Booth, former State Department spokesperson and Fox News analyst and co-host of Benson and Harf radio show, Marie Harf, and join us on the couch today for the first time, a Iraq War veteran and the Republican nominee for the U.S. Senate in Michigan, John James, the decorated combat veteran, part of one of the first classes at West Point after September 11th, to swear the oath of affirmation with the understanding that we would be going to war. And we're going to ask you a lot about that coming up here. Welcome. Um, it yeah. is a pleasure to have you on the couch. Thank you for your military service, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say about moving forward. Thank you for having me. It was an honor to serve. Vice President Mike Pence at the Pentagon honoring 184 people who died when American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the building on September 11th of 2001. 
the brave men and women who responded. The President Trump speaking in Shanksville, where Flight 93 went down, saying the sacrifice of those on the plane will never be forgotten. We're gathered together on these hallowed grounds to honor the memory of nearly 3,000 souls who were murdered on this day 17 years ago. We're here to pay solemn tribute to the 40 passengers and crew members on Flight 93 who rose up, defied the enemy, took control of their destiny, and changed the course of history. Senior correspondent Eric Sean has more from Ground Zero in Lower Manhattan. Eric. Hello, Melissa. Well, as you said, it has been 17 years, and you know it sometimes feels that not one day has gone by. There still is that emotional and solemn ceremony ongoing that started before 9 o'clock this morning as the family members and loved ones read the names and a nation pauses and remembers. At this emotional gathering, there were, as usual, four moments of silence, two to mark when the planes hit the north and the south tower, and two marking when the giant buildings collapsed. Loved ones, relatives, officials all gathering here to remember the 2,753 people who died. There were personal remembrances, tributes, and messages to those who were killed by radical Islamic terrorism. We try to make sure that we make him proud, and even though I've never met him, I love him with all my heart and miss him dearly, and I hope that he watches over my cousins and my sisters and me. I miss you. I love you very much, and I'll see you soon, and God bless America, please. We're looking live as the ceremony continues, and sadly, the legacy of this day is the increasing number of first responders and others who have fallen ill from exposure to the fumes and the dust of the collapse. 8,000 people, officials say, have been diagnosed with cancers linked to 9-11. So far, 1,700 have died. That includes 338 police officers and firefighters and even 15 FBI agents. One family member was especially defiant, Nicholas Haros. He lost his mother. He had a pointed message to politicians who compare other events to 9-11. Stop. Stop. Please, stop using the bones and ashes of our loved ones as props in your political theater. Their lives, sacrifices, and death are worth so much more. Let's not trivialize them or us. It hurts. To my mom and to all of you and your loved ones, never forget. It certainly is a day of remembrance and also one to be aware of the threat that still exists. Melissa, back to you. Eric, thank you so much. So on a day like this, I always think about the tremendous sacrifice that so many people made to try and help others in that time. And when I see counterterrorism or law enforcement around the city, I always say thank you for being here. You know, thank you for being here to protect us. John, I mean, it, it means something really to you, um, especially this idea that you went to West Point in the wake of this. I mean, knowing it must have changed what you thought you were signing up for mm -hmm. and what was ahead of you. Can you talk to us about that? Absolutely. Um, I went to West Point because I have a passion for service, and, and I've always understood that those of us who have the blessings have an obligation to be a blessing to others. Um, I went to West Point and we didn't know what was going to happen, but on September 11th, we all know where we were. Uh, right. I was actually leaving my American politics class, heading to my uh, econ class at West Point, 40 miles up the uh, Hudson River. And um, uh, we were going back and forth between classes and there were whispers in the hallway about a plane hitting a building in New York and we all thought it was a movie because this, this can't be mm. real. Yeah. Um, when we got to the class, of course, our teacher at that particular point in time always had the ticker going, and every single eyeball in the world was right here at uh, what would become Ground Zero, and we were watching as well. But as we watched one plane hit, and two planes hit, and one tower fall, and another tower fall, we watched almost 3,000 Americans perish right before our eyes. And the thing is, Everybody in the country knew that someone had to do something about this, mm -hmm. but we at West Point knew that we were the ones the country was looking to to do something about this. We knew that we were going to war, and as you mentioned, 
Uh, the class of 2004 was the first class to take the oath of affirmation, meaning that we knew that we were going to be going to war as a result of, 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 this, uh, of this heinous and tragic event. Yeah. You know, I, I see Marie nodding her head. Yeah. Uh, State Department and military at that time, the Pentagon, are very closely aligned. I mean, there was almost a, a singular mission in terms of informing the American people. Yeah, and what I did, I was in Bloomington, Indiana in college on 9-11, and I had studied politics and international relations, but it became instantly clear in that moment that this was our generation's fight, mm -hmm. like the Cold War had been, like World War II had been, and that's why I went to work for the CIA. I, four and a half years later, I was sitting in Langley taking the oath at the agency as a career official, not a political, um, and spent almost six wonderful years working there in the years when everyone coming in mm -hmm. was there because of 9-11. Right, we all were sitting in a classroom somewhere, we saw the towers fall and we thought, how can we help? That was how we felt like we could. It was an exciting time to be there because people, huge classes of people our age were signing up and saying, we don't care about the limelight, we don't care about how difficult this might be. And the fact that Afghanistan is now our country's longest war is a stunning statistic. Students that are graduating from high school this year can now enlist. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a stunning number, for, especially for those of you on the front lines. You I know, can't even imagine. It's One of the biggest. Too, you both ended up segueing into politics. I'm sorry, John. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say uh, part of that as well is 21% uh, of Americans don't realize we're still at war in Afghanistan. It's and stunning. that's mostly because only 1% of the families yeah. in this country are bearing the brunt of war. So uh, that's stunning. That that is that's truly stunning. It the is. military is what I call the other one percent mm -hmm. that people don't know about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, Lisa, I, just, I see you getting very emotional over this as well with the rest of us. Well, I, I just you know. I, I really appreciated what President Trump said today about America's future is not written by our enemies. America's future is written by our heroes. And for me, you know, I go back to 9-11. I was in high school at the time. And that day to me was defined by heroes, heroes like you and heroes like Marie as well, signing up for the CIA, going into military. And I can't imagine being at, the, at West Point knowing that the term service is drastically changed for you, knowing that you're going to war. Uh, and heroes, the Twin Hat Towers, just helping each other, uh, trying to survive. The heroes of Flight 93, yeah. taking down that flight to save yeah. so many others. And so I look right now at the country, and there's so much talk of the country being divided. But you go back on a day like that, yeah. and I think it's so important to remember that we came together as a country, that we are a resilient nation, that we are bound together by patriotism and love of country. And so I, I think it's just so important to remember this day, to never forget this day, yeah. uh, and to continue talking about it so future generations uh, don't forget what it means to be an American. John, you must yeah. have seen some of your classmates go off. I mean, what was that like? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, there's, there's something that, that happens when you leave and you know you're about to go into a tough situation and you know that everybody might not come back. Um, when you graduate or when you go off into a mission, um, there's kind of a silent uh, reassurance that whatever happens, I'm going to have your back. And whatever happens, regardless, we're going to be there for each other. And there's nothing on our uniform that says Democrat or Republican. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are all put together from different backgrounds, different genders, different ethnicities, different sexes. And because we all love this country, we all want to serve this country. And that's what we need more of as we continue to remember what happened here 17 years ago. So beautiful to hear that last note. Uh, ring at ground zero here in New York City as you were speaking of mm -hmm. military service and love of country. Very appropriate. Yep. So from that image right there. Stay close. We'll be right back. And we come in with this Fox News alert. The attorney for fired FBI agent Peter Strzok is now defending his client after President Trump seized on new allegations against Strzok and former FBI lawyer Lisa Page. They were lovers at the FBI. In a letter to Deputy A.G. Rod Rosenstein, a top House Republican says Strzok and Page engaged in a coordinated leak campaign in an effort to discredit the former Trump campaign advisor, Carter Page. 
Congressman Mark Meadows is writing this. New documents raise grave concerns regarding an apparent systemic culture of media leaking by high-ranking officials, end quote. The letter cited an April 10th, 2017 text from Strzok to Page, which said, quote, I had literally just gone to find this phone to tell you I want to talk to you about media leak strategy with DOJ, end of quote. One day after Strzok's text, this headline appeared in the Washington Post. FBI obtained FISA warrant to monitor former Trump advisor Carter Page. And the very next day, on April 12th, Strzok warned Lisa Page two articles are coming out, one worse than the other about Lisa's namesake. Strzok added, well done, Page. And here is the statement from Strzok's attorney, quote, and this is the one where he defends him now, and this has come out recently. The term media leak strategy in Mr. Strzok's text refers to a department-wide initiative to detect and stop leaks to the media. The president and his enablers are once again peddling unfounded conspiracy theories to mislead the American people, end quote. John, what do you make of it? Well, uh, this is all happening. It's, it's, it's kind of tough to swallow after uh, what happened last week with the, uh, the anonymous op-ed that we all remember. Um, there is a crisis of trust in this country where we send elected officials here to do a job to represent us all. And when you have these leaks, it fundamentally undermines the way we do business in government. This is why there's such a distaste among all Americans, uh, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on. Um, we all believe very strongly in the free press. We all believe in shining light in darkness and um, hold, uh, 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 speaking truth to power. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we re remember that uh, these leaks put our service members at risk and they discredit these news outlets. The New York Times is almost becoming like TMZ with some of the headlines we have. We need to make sure that we continue to maintain OPSEC, loose lips sink ships, and we have a little bit of discretion in the information that we're passing along. You know, what's interesting about your comments is that you kind of go beyond all the politics and just look at the pure leak that's happening, which you say is really dangerous for the country and, and leadership. Um, the politics, though, here, Lisa, are that one side labels media leak strategy one way, <laughs> and there's a different way of looking at it according to this attorney. Which is it? Well, and they were also referring to negative articles that came out about Carter Page. So I don't really buy what Peter Strzok is saying here. And you also have to remember that it was back in 2016 when Peter Strzok and Lisa Page were talking about we'll stop President Trump or then candidate Trump rather, you know, all about the insurance policy. So I'm sorry if I'm crazy to think that perhaps there was some sort of effort by Peter Strzok and Lisa Page to do precisely what they said they're going to do. And I'll also remind people, when you look at Carter Page, he is still yet to be charged with anything, yet the FBI used information from the DNC and Hillary Clinton in some way or another to obtain a FISA warrant uh, to survey Carter Page. And we also know that uh, information about the dossier has come out with Lanny Davis saying Michael Cohen didn't go to uh, Prague. And that, Can I you know, press there's in with sure. one thing, and I, I want to follow up with you real quickly before we open it up again. Um, Republicans were the ones who were allowing this document uh, to be used, these FISA warrants that we're learning about. Um, they're okaying the second and third look at Carter Page. What do you make of that? Well, look, I am really looking forward to and hope that these reports that President Trump is going to declassify the documents around Carter Page and Bruce Orr. I think mm -hmm. it is beneficial to everyone to have transparency because what John had said um, is that there is this crisis of trust in various institutions. And so my question to you as an outsider and someone who has served this country, you know, how do we regain that trust in institutions like the FBI and the DOJ? Well, uh, I think that people need to rise above the political rancor and, uh, and, and put the country before political party or affiliation. I think that people need to stop talking and start working. And that's one of the big reasons why I'm running, because uh, it's not about black and white. It's not about left and right. It's about social economic uh, upper mobility, making sure that we give people a better shot at the American dream. But I think it's so interesting, that point that you make about trust, because as I look at this, what struck me, you know, is it's so Peter Strzok writes, well done, Paige, talking about Planning the two negative articles about Carter Page. Well, we don't, um, we that don't came know out, what it's well, talking about. Well, it, it was, uh, well, I mean, they, they did this on 
April 12th, and on April 11th was when the story that okay, came out, FBI. Like, a, okay, a million but, things could have happened in those 24 hours. He, here's my question, though. <laughs> they seem to have so little faith in the system. Like, I mean, Marie, maybe you can speak to that. The idea that they felt like it seems, you know, that they needed to leak information. The Russia probe is going on. You know, you have the special counsel. But they feel so worried about stuff coming out that in spite of their own work in their own department, it's like they don't feel like their department can get it done, that they have to leak to the press. I'm not sure we can read all of that from these cryptic texts that were from two years ago that we have no other context for. I'm not defending them because I don't know, but their attorney says this was a strategy at DOJ to stop leaks. And look, Lisa Page and Peter Strzok knew much more about the investigation into Donald Trump and his campaign that never was reported before the election. If they had really wanted to hurt Donald Trump, they could have leaked everything about his investig the investigation and his campaign. So I think we need to be careful about jumping to conclusions based on text messages. We have no evidence they were the ones that leaked the Carter Page stories. If there is, I'm happy to take a look at it. Right. But I think we just need to be careful about jumping to conclusion based on years old texts that we don't have the context for. Well, the for. article cited law enforcement and other U.S. officials. It's it's uh, okay. people in the government who are leaking this who feel like yeah. the government. But we don't know that so, it's them. We have no idea who the leakers are. Well, why does are. anyone in the government feel like they need to leak? People that on both they don't sides of the, the aisle. System? People on both sides of the aisle leak for partisan purposes to Let's get their get the narrative name out. Of that op -ed writer I mean, and ask him. It, it happens <laughs> right. It happens on every side of the aisle for their own partisan so, purposes. And who knows why people leak? I mean. But I, I do want to ask you about this in, in terms of documents. And we've had so many leaks and and you know redactions and all of this. The president is getting ready to, as we understand, declassify some things. Maybe. So then we don't have to like read the crystal ball. Can't we just read the pages? Are you, as a Democrat, in favor of that? Absolutely. I would love for us to see every document that underpinned the intelligence community and law enforcement assessments of Russian in interference and of their investigations into the Trump campaign. I do not think if those are all released, they will be positive for Donald Trump. And so I'm not sure he's actually going to release them. We also have to keep the sanctity of the Robert Mueller investigation preserved. So we have to weigh that versus right. when we time leaking or excuse me, releasing things and declassifying It's hard not to them. say that word, though, isn't it? I want to get back and give you the last word, John, on all of this. We need to promote fairness and we need to promote effectiveness in our government. And we need to send people who understand the priority is God and country in that order. We swore an oath to the Constitution of the United States military, and that's where the priority is, is to continue to service and put service before self. Do you see Peter Strzok and Lisa Page in a position where they should be punished for anything that they've done so far that we know? I believe that based on what we know, the investigation is still ongoing, but once we get more information, we could probably make a better assessment of that. Okay. Sounds good. Spoken like a real military. <laughs> it's a good Got way to it. end. Yeah. Leadership. There you go. Uh, the latest on the track of the hurricane now. Florence has millions of people in its way, and they are trying to get out of harm's way, evacuating. A Category 4 storm takes aim at the Carolinas. Plus, we're counting down to the midterm elections with high stakes for both political parties as a key Democrat goes on the attack. Stay close. We're continuing to follow this beast of a storm. More than a million people ordered to evacuate as the Category 4 Hurricane Florence is bearing down on the East Coast. Miles of so far, and this has been holding really since Friday, 130 miles per hour. It's expected to hit somewhere in the Carolinas by early Friday, bringing life-threatening storm surge. 10 to 15 feet of that, forecasters are saying, up to 3 feet of rain. Could fall in some areas. States of emergency declared in Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. Again, we're watching this and we will bring in the news as it happens. New Hampshire voters heading to the polls today as primary season comes to an end, jump starting a sprint to the November elections that will test Democrats' ability to harness opposition to the president and whether President Trump can get his supporters to the polls. As a new Quinnipiac poll shows, his job approval rating falling below 40%. But the numbers are much better on the economy. Seven in ten Americans giving the economy positive marks in the new Quinnipiac poll. John, I'll start with you. Boy, I am still in that place where I don't trust the polls. On a, I mean, anything that they tell us, I just feel like we got so burned in that last election. Um, what, what is your feeling like as we hit this final stretch here about where people are, how they're feeling? 
Well, uh, the, the sentiment that I'm getting, the growing sentiment, is uh, that with everything going on and um, with the us versus them, the black versus white, the male versus female, there's a real sense in the people who I talk to that the political pundits continue get, to get their ratings and the career politicians continue to get reelected while we the people continue to get screwed. Right now in the state of Michigan, people remind us that Donald Trump won Michigan, but so did Bernie because people in the state of Michigan yeah, yeah. are sick and tired of the incumbents, sick and tired of being sick and tired, sick and tired of being lied to, sick and tired of what they see on their phone when they pick it up. They want people to work for them. There are people who are more concerned with what's going on in Washington, D.C. than what's going on in Washington in all county was going on in Detroit and Flint and Traverse yeah. City. We need to make sure that we're doing the right thing to make sure that we're, we're, we're doing it the right way. And I'm going to run a candidacy that hopefully harnesses hope and not harnesses hate. You talk about the incumbents because that's one of those big things that I think people on both sides of the aisle really focus on. I mean, I think of someone who has been in office in my home state and my hometown since I was three years old, Maxine Waters. I mean, here's what she had to say about the upcoming election, what it's really about. They say, Maxine, please don't say impeachment anymore. And when they say that, I say impeachment, 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 impeachment. impeachment. Someone asks, but what about Pence? If you were able to impeach, P Pence will be worse. And I said, look, one at a time. You <laughs> knock one down, then we'll be ready for Pence. We'll get him too. Lisa, what do you think of that? Well, there was this poll from NBC Wall Street Journal that said that the number one concern for D's taking Democrats taking over the House was gridlock. And so I think for all those voters, both Democrats and independents mm. that share that concern, when they see something like that, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to be gridlock. When you hear someone like Maxine Waters talk about that, knowing that Democrats are going to want to conduct investigations into this White House, they're going to want to slow things down. There hasn't been a lot of togetherness in places, even like the Senate, on things that they're at least say that there's a shared interest, like getting things done on immigration. So I don't think those kinds of comments help with you those voters that are worried about so gridlock. Fascinating by what you just said. Hopefully Look a lot. Look at who's <laughs> back on. Oh, all of it was fascinating. Bias, there were just some <laughs> yummier parts than others. Um, but look who's back on the campaign trail now. Mm. Talking and reaching out to evangelicals and libertarians and, quote, people who don't believe like him or think like him or agree with him, former yeah. President Barack Obama. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting what you say. Maxine Waters might not be the best messenger because she further divides with those types of of words that she uses, not to mention the call to attack people based on their, their beliefs. I, I think, and I'm certain she meant verbal. Well, um, but, but with Barack Obama back in the picture, yeah. Marie, it does kind of put a fine point on, well, he's going to be like the soother and try mm -hmm. to bring people back together. Well, and one of the most interesting things in his speech last week was when he spoke to fellow Democrats and he said, I know some of you want to fight fire with fire. I know you want to be crazy because you think the other side's crazy. That's not how we win, and also that's not how we govern. That was a shot across the bow at some Democrats who are, you know, abolish ICE, impeach, impeach, impeach. And what's interesting is Maxine mm. Waters in that message, that's not what Democratic candidates are running in my home state of Ohio. They're not running it in Virginia. Yes, in some of the bluer places, the party has a very progressive wane. But we are trying to see if moderates in the mm. party running across the Midwest can win back some of those swing districts where there are a lot of women, there are a lot of independents who are yeah. sick and tired of Donald Trump and his you're going to need that because you're going to run into this guy in Michigan. Well, but, but John, I would ask you, I mean, it, so it's interesting. Marie is so right because it depends on what district you're in. And in some districts, like Maxine Waters, that's going to work for her totally. in her area. There are other areas where that doesn't work where at all. Where does that I guess work? It, where she's running. Really? Yeah. That, that whole thing about go out and attack your neighbor? And well, no, the thing about we more impeach the than president, ever? that's going to work very well in spots. I mean, there are districts. We'll get him and then we'll get the next one? Well, well I, there are I'm, also Republicans that ran on saying that the, the number one responsibility they had in Congress after Barack Obama was elected was to make sure he was a one-term president. What so, do you mean? Let's Republicans get, it happened, the majority leader It happens on, ex that. Exactly. So yeah. there's a lot of rhetoric on both sides. What I think will be interesting in this election is despite the good economic news, although it's not everything Things not perfect, Donald Trump's approval ratings continue to slide. He is not reaping the benefit of that in the polls. And when his name's not on the ballot, there is an open question whether his base will show up to vote for people. Some Republicans, they don't even like that much. Well, yeah, John, well, this, this is, is a this great is what's question interesting, for John. Right? Where yeah. do you fall in that? Well, I, I think that uh, as you step back from all of this, we have plenty of people trying to relitigate 2016 and not <laughs> enough people thinking about 2116. Not enough people focusing on 
this $21 trillion in debt we're leaving to our kids. Mm -hmm. We have so many people in Washington um, trying to legislate and regulate futures they're not going to be a part of. And we have an obligation to make sure that we continue this amazing blessing we call United States of America for our future generations. There's so much rhetoric on both sides and so little leadership. And we need more leadership in, in in Washington and in Congress. And I think what leadership requires is, is a measured approach. You step back and you don't necessarily have the luxury of your emotions all the time. You need to use your logic. You need to compromise. Compromise is the core competency of this country. And resistance and rancor, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, is diametrically opposed to what we do as a country to move us all forward to make sure that our kids have a better future than we have. I'm not going to argue with that. That's <laughs> oh, it's so. All right, the White stated. House going on offense as Bob Woodward's book hits the shelves today. Sarah Sanders says a lack of fact checking discredits him. Seems like a very careless and reckless way to write a book. The White House pushing back on claims by Bob Woodward in his new book, Fear, which was released finally today. Woodward cites numerous instances where high-ranking administration officials question the president's competence. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders saying Woodward did little to authenticate comments quoted in the book. A number of people have come out and said that Woodward never even reached out to corroborate statements that were attributed to them, uh, which seems... Uh, incredibly reckless for a book to make such outrageous claims to not even take the time to get a $10 fact checker to call around and verify that some of these quotes were happening. When no effort was made, it seems like a very careless and reckless way to write a book. President Trump tweeting yesterday, the Woodward book is a joke, just another assault against me in a barrage of assaults using now disproven, unnamed and anonymous sources. Many have already come forward to say the quotes by them, like the book, are fiction. Dems can't stand losing. I'll write the real book! Exclamation point. <laughs> so the Woodward, well, first of all, Bob Woodward is not Omarosa when it comes to no. credibility. He has, for many, many decades, written books that have been pretty credible about many administrations of both parties. And what he says in this as a narrative that we've heard a lot now, that the president's increasingly isolated, he's increasingly sort of erratic in his behavior. Do any of these reports coming out concern you? about the Washington you might be coming into, a White House that's reportedly in chaos. Uh, I've marched into chaos before <laughs> and done my part to bring order to that chaos. And I think that's what we need more of in Washington. Leaders who understand how to make split-second decisions, life and death decisions, people who understand the tremendous weight um, that, uh, that the people put in our elected officials, not to put their own political careers first, but to put the lives of, of in my case, Michiganders and all American people first. Um, do you think Donald Trump understands that? Um, well, you know, I do believe he does. I believe he does more so than most um, people who are in Washington because he's doing something that he doesn't have to do. Man's a billionaire. He has skyscrapers walking distance from here. Um, he didn't have to do this, but for some reason, I'll tell you, when you come to my state, and yours as well. There are people who really feel like for the first time there's someone listening to them. And um, to, to regardless of, of your opinion of the tweets or whatever, um, the fact is that that's extremely empowering when you've been ignored, when you're on a farm or a factory that's been neglected or forgotten and you finally have someone who's, who's echoing your concerns. Neither right nor wrong, I'm just going to say honestly, it feels great to be heard when you feel like um, for the longest time they were saying that manufacturing jobs were a thing of the past. You just need to get over it, Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. 2% is, is, is the new normal. And when Donald Trump said that 3% is table stakes and we're going to negotiate better deals, we're going to make sure that we get this economy growing. And last quarter was 4.2% growth. And this next quarter is looking like 4.5% growth when the uh, uh, in unemployment rate is going down and you have people who are working. People uh, right now, in order to keep this economy growing, what I'm seeing is we need to do something to address the labor crisis in this country. Make sure that we can invest in our K through 12 education, early childhood development, workforce development, vocational skills, and making sure that we have a regulation. But instead, the focus is on this idea of chaos in the White House, and this is what we keep hearing about. In these They're articles. taking their eye off the ball. What what I think about when I hear chaos is I think that there are people in Washington who see the world in, as a certain order in the world. And President Trump comes in and he throws that out the window. Mm. And that makes a lot of those people really crazy. For me, I've always been someone 
very anti-establishment. When I was a kid, I loved the word anti-establishmentarianism. I was like, <laughs> that sounds wonderful, whatever that is. You know, I, cool. I mean, it's, it's, so it, it, it's, the, the chaos phrase to me is like a dog whistle to, from those people who feel like there's an order in the world that's being violated. There's a way you do things in Washington. And we say, that way hasn't worked. And like President Trump, we want to throw it out the window. I, I want to get this in because it's the first time that we've heard uh, from Gary Cohn, the former White House economic advisor to President Trump. And of course, he's mentioned in Bob Woodward's new book. He, he's uh, talked yeah. about as saying, uh, potentially taking papers off the president's desk. Mm. And so uh, this is, according to Axios, this is their reporting. Uh, what Gary Cohn is saying is that this book does not accurately portray my experience at the White House. Cohn told Axios in a statement, I am proud of my service in the Trump administration and I continue to support the president and his economic agenda. Just want to get that in there. There have been reports now of some uh, inconsistencies and, and things that are not substantiated in the new book that comes out that's called Fear. And so we want to get those statements out as, as quickly as they come from former members of the president's team because they matter. Lisa. Well, and that denial does not stand alone. You also have uh, Secretary Mattis, you have General Kelly, you have Chris Christie, you have Navy SEAL Rob O'Neill that said he, that, uh, he was mentioned, it wasn't accurate, and Bob Woodward didn't bother to pick up the phone. But I, I think the broader point here is the one that you made, John, and the sense of if chaos means, you know, blue collar jobs growing at the fastest pace in 30 years under President Trump, historic tax reform, I, a deteriorated ISIS, uh, deregulation, all these things, Americans' lives are better off than they were under President Obama. So if that is chaos, chaos, I think a lot of Americans are going to embrace that and be fine with it. And I think there's a bigger danger to uh, the media more generally because this continued use of anonymous sources when we've seen so many stories wrong, when there's so much distrust in institutions, in the media, I think it is dangerous. And I think people need to start going on the record if they actually have any issues. Well, everyone uses anonymous sources, so we will keep watching this story. And be sure to tune in tomorrow when Bob Woodward himself will be joining Dana Perino on The Daily Briefing. That's tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Be Ooh. sure to watch. And new word coming from the Trump administration about a possible second summit with North Korea. Stay tuned. We'll discuss. Welcome back. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders announcing the White House is considering a possible second summit with North Korea's Kim Jong-un after Kim sent a letter to the president. Watch. The primary purpose of the letter was to request and uh, look to schedule another meeting with the president, uh, which we are open to and are already in the process of coordinating that. A number of things that have taken place, the remains have come back, uh, the hostages have returned, there's been no testing of mi missiles or nuclear material, and uh, of course the historic summer summit between the two leaders. And um, this letter is just further indication of the progress that we hope to continue to make. This new development came on the same day that White House National Security Advisor John Bolton said he was frustrated with the North Korea's lack of progress dismantling its nuclear arsenal. So, John, where are we with North Korea right now? Well, um, I, I believe that we're in a much better position than we were uh, in the previous few years and definitely in the previous number of decades. Um, we are still technically at war with North Korea. And I believe that uh, anyone who expected in this digital age to immediately denuclearize and unify the entire peninsula uh, was, uh, was a bit wrong-headed. I think that the pressure on, uh, on China and on Russia, let me back up a little bit. I believe the two greatest threats to the United States of America. Uh, one is the growing spheres of communist influence all over the world, which is affecting the Middle East and in Asia. And the second most severe is the divisiveness and the refusal to work together here at home. I think the first step, um, uh, pressuring China to work with North Korea to denuclearize and, uh, and to make sure that we're using all the leverage possible so that we're t handling this economically and politically and not in terms of war. Do you think full denuclearization is possible with North Korea? I think that you certainly shouldn't start from a compromised position. You always lead with your first and your primary and your best position and then you work together with your allies, with your intelligence agencies, always reserving the, uh, the, the full complement of, of, uh, of military action should, in the last resort, that it be required. Well, and real quick, do you think, so President Trump canceled Mike Pompeo's trip, 
Then there's this letter, which is apparently right. warm, wanting to have this second meeting. Was that the right call to cancel that trip? Well, I just don't know what the strategy is, right? Because everything Sarah Sanders listed was true before they canceled the Pompeo trip, and it's true today. And so I don't know why they canceled the trip. They thought maybe they weren't getting enough progress, but what progress has been made since they canceled to now justify another leader summit, which is a very big deal for the North Koreans. That's almost giving them something when we don't have an example of tangible progress. I just, I want to see more of a strategy from this White House and not letters back and forth between the two leaders. That's not going to get us denuclearized here. I, I totally agree, although we don't know what's going on and we don't know what's been given, but I do trust Mon Mike Pompeo and also Ambassador Bolton to be very tough and very clear-eyed and to not sit down or set up another meeting and get, unless something tangible has been achieved on that front. All right, well, we'll discuss this at a later point, I'm sure, and more outnumbered in just a moment, so stay tuned. Thank you so much to John James. Did you like it? You enjoyed it? You lived? This was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I made it through. Your You've combat been service prepared yeah. you yes, for Yes, yes. All of my training at West Point brought me to this moment. <laughs> Thank well, you, you, you succeeded. So. There you go. <laughs> thanks, All Bob, right. Well, thanks to the whole couch. We're going to keep an eye on that hurricane. We're back here at noon Eastern tomorrow. For now, here is Harris.